This week's reading in Luke's Gospel brings up one of the central themes of Lent, our need to repent as we face and prepare for God's judgment, but it does so in a very complex and provocative manner. Luke 13, the first nine verses. At that time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Were those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. And this is from the Revised Standard Version. Last week and this week's readings from Luke's Gospel are part of Luke's record of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, which stretches from 951 to 1927. Within that larger narrative, our reading is a subsection, and this runs from beginning of chapter 12 up to 13.9. This is the final section in an extended discourse that challenges us to prepare for God's judgment. This week's reading from Luke 13 breaks into two nice, neat parts. First off, the discussion of these two tragedies, and then the second part is the parable of the fig tree at the end. Let's consider the two tragedies first. The Galileans that Pilate killed and those that died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Now these events are not recorded in any other ancient documents, but the two stories fit well with what we know about Pilate's ruthlessness and the possibility of ancient building accidents like this. These two incidents are used to convey two ideas. First, they are used as a warning to all those who do not change their way, 13.3. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. In this way, this reading serves as a warning and an incentive to prepare our hearts during Lent for Easter, but also for the longer journey when we will in the end stand before God's judgment seat. Second, it raises questions about God's judgment on those who suffer tragedy. He asks them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? I want to spend a little bit of time on this second question because it's definitely the more difficult of the two. Does God reward the righteous and punish the wicked? We're very prone to think that God rewards good behavior and punishes bad behavior. And this comes from some of the biggest mouths on the internet. Think back to the start of the AIDS epidemic if you're that old. How many of the Christian leaders proclaimed that this was God's judgment on the homosexual community? That is, until it spread to everyone else. Billy Graham himself was asked in 1993 if AIDS was a judgment by God, and he replied, I could not say for sure, but I think so. Now, the thing I gotta give it to Billy Graham is that he later apologized for that remark. I wish that this debate was limited to just this one sad incident, but some Christian leaders seem to relish in blaming those who are suffering. After 9-11, Jerry Falwell went on the air and claimed that what happened needed to be laid at the feet of pagans, feminists, abortionists, gays, lesbians, and the ACLU. Those horrible people. In response to Hurricane Katrina hitting New Orleans, John Hagee taught that I believe that New Orleans had a level of sin that was offensive to God and that they were the recipients of God's judgment for that. He later took it back, but it was out there. I don't know how many times I've heard it proclaimed that COVID is God's judgment on America for its moral failings. The problem is COVID is not restricted, nor does he even care about who is or isn't an American. It's a pandemic that has killed over 6 million people in the world. And in the US, we are quickly approaching 1 million confirmed deaths from COVID. 
We only have 4% of the world's population, but we have almost 20% of the deaths from COVID. That statistic alone should serve as a wake-up call to how we live our lives in the United States. But I digress. When tragedies like this happen, we naturally try to find answers. Why did this happen? Why did God allow this to take place? What is God trying to teach us through this tragedy? Now within the church and other religious beliefs as well, the temptation is to say that we have all the answers. We have the Bible, we have the truth, and we can tell you what this is all about. In the book of Deuteronomy, God is Israel's Lord. If they obeyed him and kept his covenant, then he would bless them. And this is the lens by which many interpret disease and natural disaster through today. But this is an incomplete reading of the Old Testament. When you read the prophets, the Psalms, and other books, you see the people of Israel questioning why God would allow the righteous to suffer and the wicked to prosper. Why does God send rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous? The book of Job is perhaps the classic example of this. Here was a righteous man who God allowed to suffer terribly. And the book never gives Job a clear answer for why this happened. Instead, it concludes with God questioning Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? In other words, if you think you're so smart as to sort out the moral issues behind your suffering, how about telling me something simple, like how I made the earth maybe? There's a number of problems when we reason along these lines. In other words, when we think that this person or these people are suffering because of their moral failures, they are under God's judgment for their behavior. First off, this is a thoroughly one-sided reading of the Old Testament. Second, I doubt that any of them would argue that the church lives under the Torah or the book of Deuteronomy today. Rather, we are under the great commandments to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Love is not a choice or an emotion. It's a divine imperative. When condemnation of others for their behavior or who they are replaces love as our first priority, we lose our voices in that conversation. And perhaps most seriously, it puts us in a false position. We think that we are above them. We are judging them. If you live like we do, you would not have any of these problems. It flows from a position of self-righteousness and intolerance, and we need to realize that we have gone astray as well. These two tragedies, Pilate's slaughtering of the Galileans and the tragedy of the Tower of Siloam, teach us two things. First, these tragedies serve as an example and a warning that unless we amend our ways, we're going to suffer a similar fate. Second, to try and lay the blame for their calamity on their moral failings, from our perspective, is simplistic and it's a mistaken understanding and approach to human suffering. Now, after addressing these two tragedies, Jesus then tells them a parable. And I want to remind you that I have an entire series on the parables, over 20 videos. I'll have a link up here, plus in the discussion below. So if you're interested, please go and take a look at those videos on the parables. Where was I? Oh yeah, the parable of the fig tree. A parable does not give a definite answer. A parable is designed to make you think. So let's put on our thinking caps and look at this parable. I'm going to reread it again here. The parable of the fig tree in 13, 6 through 9. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it, and he found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. In this parable, we have a landowner and a vine dresser or a gardener. The landowner is frustrated by a particular tree in his vineyard. Now, fig trees are mentioned over 60 times in the Bible. They grow to be about 15 feet tall and were often planted in vineyards for shade or for their fruit. And they were definitely seen as a status symbol or a blessing. It was great to have a tree like this on your property. The problem is, this one is not producing fruit. As a result, the landowner wants it cut down. 
It's not producing fruit and it's taking up valuable space. Cutting down this tree represents considerable financial loss for the landowner, and we're not told if he's going to replant or replace that tree. This is one of those gaps in the parable that you are expected to fill in. The vine worker pleads for one more year of opportunity for the tree, during which he will provide special nurture and care for it. So what is this parable all about? Well, let's look at the characters first. I think the landowner is meant to be an allusion to God, but the gardener is hard to pin down. Is he a prophet? Jesus? Someone praying? We have no idea. All that we know is that he intercedes on behalf of this fig tree. Some read the landowner and the vine dresser symbolically. The landowner represents God's judgment and the vine dresser God's mercy. Edward Schweitzer in his commentary on Luke writes, Something in the mystery of Jesus can be seen in the image of God against God in order that grace may be offered to all. In the end, nailing down who the vine dresser is and who the landowner is really not significant. The whole point is, is that this tree is going to be chopped down if it doesn't bear fruit, but it's got one more year. What about the fig tree? I think Luke wants us to read these in terms of those who died at Pilate's hand or under the tower's collapse. But that connection does not work all that well. They did not get extra time. They did not get extra care. So that connection is violated. It's not a clear or good connection between the fig tree and those who died. Rather, I think it forces us to think. There is no indication in the account of those that Pilate killed or those that the tower fell on that they were not good people. In fact, the Galileans have said that they were there to make a sacrifice. Then what is going on? If the fig tree had been cut down in the parable, then yeah, we could see their death at Pilate's hand parallel to the fig tree being chopped down immediately at that moment when the landowner finds no fruit on it. But that's not in the parable. And there's also another interesting feature in this parable. We're not told what the landowner decides. Will he give this fig tree another year or not? What do you think? I think Luke and Jesus leave this parable open in that regard because it provokes us and makes us think. This parable holds a difficult tension and balance. On the one hand, it raises the need for repentance. 13.3 No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish like they did. On the other hand, there is possibility that some grace and time might be given before the judgment, and that patience is laced with grace, care, and nurturing. So how do you hold these two paradoxical ideas together? I think the cross provides an answer. On the cross, we see God's judgment, but it's on Jesus, not on us. And also, we live between the cross and God's final judgment. Maybe living during that additional year that the vine dresser talked about. We also have God's grace, love, and nurturing kindness poured out on us during this time. I'm reminded once again after I went through this, just as I mentioned last year, that the readings for Lent are really difficult. They're challenging to study and they're challenging to teach. And guess what? We've got a few more weeks to go through as we continue our journey through Lent. Until next week, when we have another uplifting and encouraging reading, peace. Peace.